Good evening. We begin with a preview of Predaporte, the film Robert Altman has stitched together with swatches of gags, subplots, and star turns. When Altman first announced he was going to turn his lens on the international fashion madhouse that is the annual Paris Predaporte week, catwalks trembled in delicious anticipation. It seemed the perfect Altman project, an ensemble piece like Nashville Shortcuts or The Player, promising Altman's particular mix of pop celebration and satire. Sadly, the finished product is closer to those leaden comedies he made in the late 70s, Health and a Wedding. Preta Porte is a reminder that this director's work has famously swung from being exhilaratingly on target to up Altman Creek without a paddle or even a boat. Desperate movie executives Americanized the title at the last minute to ready to wear, but nothing could keep the film afloat in the States. Moving pictures talked to Altman, his screenwriter Barbara Schulgasser, and Vogue film critic John Powers in an attempt to discover what went so badly wrong with the master's new collection. This is Kitty Potter, reporting live on the first day of the fall 1994 Paris collection. The remarkably well-preserved crowd of fashion folk you see around me look as though they're about to break into the Bonjour Paris number from Funny Face, don't they? But in reality, they're headed for the trenches. Fashion, my friends, is war. Well, I think when, when the film was first announced, the fashion world was really excited because fashion people love satires of fashion. You know, all the fashion people I know love Absolutely Fabulous, for example. So they were really excited to think that Robert Altman, who, who made the player, which they all liked, would be making a film about them. Congratulations. Hello, darling. A wonderful show. Well, what about the shapes? Are they feminine? Well, Kitty, I think that my ideal woman has a bust, waist, and hips. And she's not shy of her shoulders. I think, I think shoulders are very fresh again. And, of course, legs. She doesn't have to have legs, but oh, it's, it's wonderful if she does, don't you think? There are people said, oh, I know this is going to be dreadful. I know you're going to do terrible things, and I'm going to come and see this awful picture, and we're going to, uh, you've created all these lies about our business, and they came and saw it, and they said, oh, uh, this wasn't so bad, so I don't like it so much. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> fashion people actually were expecting an accurate representation of their world. But I think what they were looking for was a sort of sly, knowing representation of their world. Because when I, whenever I talk to the fashion people in Vogue, for instance, they always talk about how funny it is. You know, they actually get a kick out of their own excesses. That's the part of the pleasure of the entire fashion business. And so, so for them, they were hoping the film would capture that, and they would get to see on screen some of the stuff they have so much fun with in their own work and lives. This is not real, this is not dramatic necessarily, this is a, uh, an essay film and it's a farce. I'm the editor of a fashion magazine and you're the photographer, but I'm American and I'm so noisy and you're so quiet, so goddamn Irish, I mean you're like the quiet man. Oh, I don't know what to do, I want you to sign this contract and I want you, so take me, Ow! God, what are you doing? Oh, God, what are you doing? You son of a bitch! Get out of here! If it were really funny and enjoyable and well-made, it wouldn't matter that the film isn't accurate about fashion. I mean, lots of Hollywood comedies over the years are set in particular milieus and actually don't reveal anything at all about the milieu. But in this particular case, it, it's that deadly combination of being inaccurate about the subculture it's describing and at the same time just not being funny. One of the problems of the film is that there are lots of repeated gags which don't work. There's, there's a particular one of people stepping in dog excrement, which evidently the filmmakers found screamingly funny, because I think they do it four or five times, yet the audience starts groaning about the second time. Uh, 
Uh, this is Kitty Potter in Paris, and I'm here with Terry Mugler, the cutting edge couturier known for his tutorial shock tactics. Terry, Terry, you know, it's been said, it's been said that your clothes have a kind of overt, extreme sexual subtext, which is squarely at odds with uh, the image of women as capable and independent of men. So I was just wondering, our audience would love to know really what you think about that. Well, it's all about looking good, helping the silhouette. And it's all about getting great f honey. <laughs> all the fashion people were very used to cameras because they're covered all the time, twice a year at their own shows. They're, they, they do interviews, they're, their documentaries are done about them. They're on camera a lot. So they have developed, uh, they kind of know what they're doing. And uh, it was more the case of getting our actors not to act than it was to get the non-actors to act. Performances really aren't the important thing. Uh, the important thing is, is that whole big sweep, you know, the, the Altman-esque kind of commentary, uh, the, the overall feeling of the thing. And, and the actors pretty much are uh, there to sort of convey that message, but they don't get much of a chance to, to really show their stuff. There is a problem when you start having films with lots and lots and lots of stars. Once Altman became hip because of the player, everybody wanted to work with him, and they all wanted to do their little bit and to work very cheaply. What happens with, with Ready to Wear is the film becomes clotted with sort of small cameos and small roles that simply don't work. I hope that you can be a gentleman and that we can just say what happened last night never happened, okay? Sure, no problem. No problem, really. Yeah, whatever you want. The main reason of having known kind of famous actors in there is for the audience's identification. If I had had brilliant actors in all those parts, uh, that, but nobody recognized them, 20 minutes into the film, you'd say, wait a minute, I don't know where I am. Who, who, I forget, who was that? Which one was that? Just forgotten, like that, it's so easy. Yeah. That's great. What, what, am I supposed to be crushed or something? No, 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 this is, this is great. This is just great, you know? Yeah, that's... Oh, come on, I'll change your channel! I think a good director, the most important thing he does, if he's a an actor, is he casts him. And once he's cast him, he, he, a good director normally throws him into the pool and watches him swim. Women make dresses for themselves and for other women. Mm -hmm. A man makes clothes for a woman he wants to be with, or as in most cases, for the woman he wants to be. A lot of people think that it's a challenge to write for someone who depends so much on improvisation on the set, but um, this didn't seem like a problem to me. I never thought, um, uh, a question that I hear so often is, um, uh, what is it like to hear your words spoken on the screen? And I never thought that that was going to happen. Uh, I provided the script with a structure and um, plot lines and the interweaving and, and sort of the ins and outs and the rhythms. Well, almost every scene in the film was improvised. I mean, the real ones, we, we had no control over at all. We had to just go and put our people in and shoot. But even the ones we created, there were so many people that we couldn't rehearse and say, we're going to do this or that. There was never a rehearsal. We would just turn two cameras, three cameras on, and, and we would then shoot what happened, what the actors did, pretty much like we would do, deal with a documentary. We started off the shoot, for example, um, shooting fashion shows. And uh, we had to go into the fashion shows at the beginning acting, and we had to act right until the end, um, because we never knew where the cameras were. There were like 10 cameras all over the, the big carousel in the Louvre. And you never knew when they were going to be on you, because some of the close shots were in, on long lenses, which meant they were far away. And, um, and that sort of set the, set the rhythm for me. The, 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 that was the taste of working with Bob, which was you just didn't know when he was there. It depends on what you want to get out of actors. I suppose that's a way of certainly unsettling them rather than relaxing them. Um, Maybe he was looking for that frenetic tone in the movie, and he felt that that would be a good way of doing it. Just, just remember, when you're there, you because there's no way I can let you know when a camera's on you or not. Don't worry about making mistakes. I will not leave anything in this film where you look bad. Altman, as a director, is rather like um, 
a sort of voyeuristic god figure. Um, he's often in another room behind a bank of televisions with his headphones on. And uh, he has all the actors on radio mics, so he can hear everything you're talking about, everything you're saying, even when you go down to the toilet or whatever. And so there's very much an atmosphere of Big Brother around. You never know quite where he is. I don't see him that often. <laughs> I hug him. I hug him when I first get here. And then I don't see him for the rest of the night. He just calls me Kitty. Stand over there and <laughs> Kitty Kitty, and I don't know whether he's calling me or his cat. Uh, when we were writing together, um, he kept saying the words aren't important. Um, I, I disagree. How do you find the jewelry? How do you find the jewelry? Oh, uh, well, I usually shove my hand down the back of the sofa. <laughs> Hopefully, I come up with something. I'm talking about the Bulgaria porcelain piece. Um, yes, I know you are, but it's just such a boring question to ask, you know, unimaginative. Can't anyone ask anything serious every now and again? Okay. How do you feel that 50% of the world's pollution is caused by the textile mills? When we were on the set in Paris, Harvey Weinstein of Miramax said to me, um, can't you get Altman to put some of your dialogue back? And I said, you get him to. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking what an interesting concept it is to eliminate the writer from the artistic process. If we can just get rid of these actors and directors, maybe we got something here. <laughs> One thing that disappoints me about a lack of very good, sturdy, bright, sparkling dialogue is that I think there's a, a part of your brain that you use when you're acting and another part that you use when you're composing what you're going to say to somebody. And they seem to uh, be at odds with each other to some degree. Uh, I think that, that there's something to be said for an actor sitting there with a lines and memorizing them and somehow making them part of himself or making himself part of them, whatever it is that alchemy that occurs when an actor is really cooking. And um, I think that you just get a, a, um, a level of performance, a profundity that you don't get when you throw the actors on the set, even if they're really great. I mean, women love you, Cher. I mean, they I mean, this is Cher. Cher, okay. And so I told everybody who was asking me for help that I would be happy to help them uh, in a closet or <laughs> under a chair or um, any place that wasn't so public. And they used many lines that we came up with together. Um, and as long as Altman believed that they were made up by the actors, he thought they were wonderful. I do a film every year. I mean, I, I, I never stop working. And I come back with this film, and many of the critics will say, oh, well, uh, this wasn't as good as your last film. And, and, and they can't, they'd like it much better if I did a film every three years but that doesn't suit me. So I know that if I have a, a success or maybe two successes in a row, then I'm in trouble. Because then they expect so much uh, from the next one and then it, it not, it'll go like this. Film critics are just bored by it. Whereas fashion people who know what's going on constantly talk about the missed opportunity. This should have been a great film. There's so much material and they're the ones who are probably the unhappiest with it. It seems to me that looking at this process of, of creating moving pictures, that what you end up with is um, uh, a crapshoot, that it's, it's completely accidental when you come up with something fabulous and just as accidental uh, when you come up with something that is terrible because um, uh, no one sets out to make a really bad movie. So what would you uh, write about this charming ensemble in your column, man? I'd say it's um, very... Pret a porte. <laughs> Pret a porte opens on Friday. Even hardcore Altman fans like me have to admit that he simply doesn't take fashion seriously enough to be funny about it.